Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us as we recap 2021, and we look forward to the 2022 season. Today, we're joined by Chief Soccer Officer and Sporting Director, Chris Henderson. If you have a question in the room or on the call, please raise your hand. As a reminder, one question per turn, and please state your name and outlet before asking the question. We'll get started now with Chris. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for being here, taking the time. Um, yeah, I wanted to touch on, I've been in this league since 1996, player, coach, executive now. Um, and I think back of what, uh, what makes successful top teams in MLS. Um, utilizing home field advantage. Um, it's shown that, that winning 50% or more of your home games will help you have success. Uh, uh, chance creation, efficiency in front of goal uh, is important. Consistency in all attacking metrics. Um, possession that will get you into scoring opportunities, success on set pieces, uh, and, and having unbeaten runs, uh, averaging nine games or more. Uh, I think those are, that's a quarter of the season. Those are the things that bring you success. Uh, looking at this year, I think consistency would be something we have to look at. And going forward, we need to focus on consistency. Uh, six losses in a row, and then a summer of 11 games with one loss, um, uh, you know, and then, then turning around and having six more losses. So, you know, you, you straighten those out, uh, only having five ties. Uh, so we need to be a team that's hard to beat. We need to grind for points at times and just focus on consistency. Uh, what I'm really proud of with, the, with what has happened behind the scenes uh, we all want success with, from the first team, uh, but the culture that's been put in place. Um, Phil and I started about nine weeks before the season. Uh, we worked for the first 150 days with Sportsology on mission, vision, values, our culture of ambition, collaboration, excellence, and having everyone in the building live those values. Uh, we have added a great staff. Uh, Craig Dalrymple now with our academy is working on the future, and that is so important for Jose Moss, Jorge Moss, David Beckham, and, and the way we move forward in, in building players for the future. Uh, Darren Powell at the second team and his relationship with Phil Neville and the coaching staff from the first team, second team, and the academy coaches, they have a great relationship, working relationship. We have a new performance director in Don Scott coming in. Uh, she's worked for the U.S. Women's National Team, the FA a Women's Team, uh, two master's degree, PhD. She's a great addition. Uh, Megan Cameron, also player personnel, compliance. Uh, her, her history and work with roster and budget guidelines uh, is a big help. Uh, Director of Scouting, Mark Prezant. Uh, he manages all our scouts worldwide. Uh, and, and looking at players, uh, making sure we're organized there. Uh, he works alongside uh, uh, Sam Gregory, who's director of analytics, and we have data throughout the process from the very beginning of our scouting pro process, which is seven steps. Um, data is all the way through that. And then uh, lastly, Nikki Budalich's work with uh, soccer operation. So I feel like we now have processes that are in place for all of this that, that weren't in place when I arrived. And I think this is what's gonna give us the foundation for long-term sustained success. And we, were, we are working diligently on, on improving the first team heading into next year. Thank you, Chris. If you have a question, please raise your hand. We're gonna get started with Lauren. Thank you, Rafa. Hi, Chris. Hi, Laura. This year was the first year the team was able to be out in the community due to the pandemic. How important is it to you and to the club to have players, you know, out connecting with the local community? Yeah, I mean, that, it's one of the biggest things for me is, is how we can become a fabric of this community as a club. And that is players, that is staff. Um, we, have, we have had some great initiatives with uh, kicking childhood cancer that the players were involved in, uh, the thank you at uh, to Baptist nurses and doctors that the whole team went to, uh, the work on uh, pa Patricio Heda, um, the, the, patient, the cancer patient who came to the club, um, the players gave him a jersey, and, and the work we'll do on Thanksgiving, a food drive, holiday events. I think those are things we need to do, and when players come to this club, it is talked about when they when they arrive and and it's important to uh the moss brothers it's important to david beckham to make sure 
we are important in the South Florida community. Next question, Michelle Kaufman, Miami Herald. Okay. Well, you said it for me. Thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I'm going to have a few questions, but I'll ask the first one and then we'll pass it around. Right, Rafa, we can get a second one later. Okay. Um, Phil had talked about, and you have talked about, you know, having uh, youth for next, next year's roster, a little bit more youth, a little bit more speed and all that stuff. Uh, I'm wondering where Ryan Shawcross fits in. He didn't really get to play that much this season. He's, you know, an older guy, not a speed guy. Uh, what do you see his future with the team right now? Thank you. Okay, on the first part with, uh, with youth, Michelle, it's, uh, I, I'm very excited because Phil Neville is great at working with young players. Uh, one of the best that I've seen on the grass and uh, having them believe in him, working with them, I think there's going to be an opportunity. Early in the year, we saw Escona get minutes. Later in the year, Mabika got some minutes. So um, I, I think uh, with what we're uh, dealing with in the next two years, we're going to need to rely on youth and, and developing those players. Um, uh, Ryan had surgery on his back, so we will, we will see how things uh, progress with that and then uh, make a decision after the new year. Thank you. Next question, Franco. Then we'll go to Austin. Hey, Chris. Franco Panizo, hey, Franco. Uh, Miami Total Football. Uh, so I guess we don't have questions to, to waste here. So um, every sign points to, to, uh, to Phil coming back. Um, you know, I, I think everyone in this room probably expects him to come back. Obviously, the results weren't um, what anyone expected. I, I know during one point in the season when you guys were on a good run, you said you wanted the team to finish maybe top four. In, in the East, I think you said that on the broadcast. Um, I get continuity, I understand that, but what is the reasoning for bringing Phil back um, in 2022 uh, when the results were not did not were worse than last year in terms of the standings, in terms of where you guys finished? What, what, what are you guys looking at to do by bringing Phil back in 2022? Yeah, Franco, I think, um, you know, you look at when we came in. We came in uh, about nine weeks before the season. We tried to make some, some quick adjustments to the roster. Uh, without some real processes in place, but trying to improve uh, in what we are. There's some positives in that with Gregory and Marsman, some of the signings we had. Um, but again, Phil is, uh, he's fantastic with young players. I think with what we're, we're dealing with in the next two years, that's going to be very important. Um, I, I think Phil is a very good coach, and I think this will give us the opportunity moving forward together to have our fingerprints on this roster, which... Um, I really don't feel like it's there yet, but it is coming, and, and we're, we're working on building a team of players who are committed to our values and the way that Phil wants to play, his staff wants to play, and what we want at this club. Next question, Austin, then Dighton. Austin Robillard with uh, Five Reasons Sports. I wanted to ask about uh, Indiana Vasilev and his status. Obviously, there was a coaching change at Villa. He was here on loan. Um, what did you see from him this year, and is there talk to hopefully try and bring him back for 2022? Yeah, good question. Indiana's been a great addition. Uh, you know, we've we've continued talks with Aston Villa. Um, they're going to take a look at him uh, with the new coaching staff. Um, you know, if if Indiana is able to come back and that that's an opportunity, we we'd welcome him back. Um, I thought his energy on the field, uh, the way he could change a game. Um, he scored a big goal for us uh, when he first came back. So um, these are the types of opportunities I think that we need to look for uh, with the sanctions coming and, and uh, opportunity to bring players on loan uh, where maybe some of the salaries subsidized. Next question, Dairon. Then we'll go back to Michelle. Thank you, Rafa. Dairon Quiroz for VVM Radio. Chris, uh, I wanted to ask you, you were just talking about the possibilities of bringing players on loan. Uh, maybe I don't know if you're going to sign up any player uh, due to the sanctions, but which are the main positions that you want to cover for next season? Yeah, I mean, some of it based on uh, some of the conversations we have right now on, on player movement. There could be some players that move, uh, that deals come to us that we will look at and take, and that may open up a position that we're not thinking of. But um, I think... You know, the spine of the team in, in MLS is very important, and it's usually where, where teams spend their money, you know, a striker, a midfielder, a central defender. Um, so I think building from a good spine of the team is important. Um, as we make changes, some of those negotiations are happening, some trade talks are happening. So, you know, we have to see how those play out and how we're going to fill those positions. Go back to Michelle. 
Uh, keeping on that theme of player movement, trades, and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, obviously you guys have the financial restraints now that you have with the sanctions and all that. Uh, so you're going to have to get rid of some players who maybe are um, some of the more valuable players on the team, who are sometimes the better players on the team also, not always the case. But uh, the players that other teams are interested in are also the players that your fans love the most in many cases. Um, how do you go about making those decisions and how many, if you had to estimate, you know, how many of that level of player do you think that you're going to lose and how will you explain that to the fans? You know, that you're going to have to maybe get rid of players that, that they love and who have played well, not necessarily players that didn't play well. Yeah, good question, Michelle. I was one of those players when I played who got <laughs> moved around. But, um, you know, I think players know it's part of the business. Uh, um, I think there will be opportunities where um, if you have good players on your team, teams are going to ask for those players. And often it's the same players getting asked from multiple teams. Um, and we will listen to, to, to every offer and we'll evaluate how the um, maybe the player that would come in how they will uh, connect with other players we have. And we have to be able to build a team that has players that complement each other. Um, so we will look at, look at opportunities to improve our team. We will look at opportunities to um, um, support our salary cap and how we're going to move forward. Again, I said young players is one. Loans are another possibility. Um, and it may be that uh, it's about trust and trust of what we're building and where we're going because maybe the next player comes in becomes a fan favorite for, for everyone here as well. And, and we want to make sure that we are, we are being strategic in the way that we build around uh, the core players here. We're going to take a couple questions from the call. First with Steve Brenner, then Tom Bogart. Hey, Chris, Steve Brenner here, working for UK Media. I mean, you've obviously been involved in a lot of preseason you know, roster changes throughout your career as a, as a player and, and as, as, as a general manager or whatever, but how problematic have the sanctions kind of been in terms of being able to build? Because I, I, I assume you've never really had this sort of situation before. You know, it, it must be a huge, huge problem in terms of planning, I would have thought. Yeah, I mean, there are some moves we can make that will minimize it, um, and we're looking at all of those. Uh, some of those go down to what I talked about just now, what what kind of offers come our way, whether we are trading a player for just uh, general allocation money, that's an option, or whether we trade for a player and uh, a combination of player and money. Um, and again, uh, you know, as I said, Phil's great with working with young players. We're going to have to give uh, opportunities for young players to come through. Um, there are some challenges for sure, but with every challenge comes opportunity, an opportunity for a young player to step up, for another player who hasn't had a lot of minutes this year to uh, make an impact in the roster, and that's how you find good players. So I think the focus on, one, the process of how we bring players in is really important, and I feel very confident now on what we have in the front office through the coaching staff uh, to help us minimize the risks on our signings. Next question, Tom. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for taking the time, Chris. Um, you know, in, in kind of talking about the theme of, of flexibility and, and, you know, expectations for the offseason with, with the sanctions and everything, a lot of fans and, and people look at the top of this roster. Uh, I know it's early in the offseason, but would the expectation be that all three DPs are back next year? First, all, all three DPs are under contract, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I think we we listen to offers, and um, you know, Rodolfo's one. I, I, I we all watched the U.S. Mexico the other night, and uh, why Rodolfo's not in that team, I don't understand because he can unlock things around the penalty box. So I would expect that you know the next round Mexico is bringing him in. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, we're moving forward with our DPS, and I think we are looking at all options, listening to all options to help us improve the team. Next question, Jose. Thank you, Rafa. This is Jose Rodriguez from the Porte Total USA. Hi, Chris. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Edison Ascona. You know, it's a player that, you know, shows some talent, recently played with the um, Dominican Republic uh, under 20 national team, made, was able to score a couple goals there. Uh, but we did not see him this year. Uh, at all with the with the first team um, where is he in the process and do you envision him 
uh, having a bigger role next year. Thank you. Yeah, good question, Jose, and thanks for bringing up Edison. He he had a great goal last week uh, for Dominican. Um, showed his acceleration, um, a great fr- finish from the top of the box. Um, he's a player, yeah, we have high hopes for. Uh, he started the season playing some minutes with the first team. Um, and just like with any uh, young player, it's about finding consistency, some up and downs. Uh, you learn about your, your body. You learn about your um, your uh, everyday training uh, uh, with men in the environment. And he's learning and growing. And I think we're going to give him a lot of attention and, and see if he can progress into his next year. Next question, Franco, then Lauren. Chris, you were, you were asked about the DPs. Um, I would ask you, what's your review of how they performed this season? Because obviously the team in general, I know you went through it there at the beginning, um, fell short in a lot of departments, but the DPs also seem statistically not, not to necessarily deliver um, as much as they should or as much as is, is needed in, in the MLS. So what's your review of them? And if I could just fit in a, a, a quick second one. So have talked to you, have talked over the course of this season about the chemistry in the locker room and, and how that hasn't necessarily been the best at all times. Um, after the season ended, we saw Rodolfo go on Twitter and, li- and like a lot of critical tweets about Gonzalo. Um, just your thoughts on that and, and how you go forward from here with those three DPs, um, obviously taking into account your, your review as well. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Franco. The first question, uh, the DPs, I think, um, you look at Blaise Matuidi, he's a guy who's a ball winner, and uh, he competes every game, uh, gives everything he has. Um, I think um, super competitive, wants to win, has had an amazing career. Um, uh, the way that uh, you know he looks for Iguain up top, I think their relationship and, and some of their history together uh, shows at times. Um, Gonzalo, I think he was part of over 50% of our goals scored this year. So his production was actually excellent. Um, both, uh, I would say all of our DPs are super competitive. They all want to win and they came from winning environments. So I think maybe at times uh, they were frustrated uh, during our losing streaks because they want to win and they care, which for me is important that they care about the results and they're not coming here to wind down their careers, they're coming to win. Um, and, uh, and Rodolfo, as I said, he can, he can unlock things around the box. We saw moments where Gonzalo and uh, Rodolfo combined well for some goals together, and that was a glimpse of what they can do when they're both on and, and connecting with each other. So um, I think that's, that, that group of players has the potential to carry this team. Um, did we do it every game this year? I think we fell short in some games, um, but some of that comes down to complete, you know, the complete team um, uh, performance and and confidence at times. So I, I think that's part of the season is just trying to get uh, more consistency. And when you do have a game or two, how you rebound, how you respond. Good teams will respond quickly to come back. So there's definitely tweaking to do and some work to do there. Um, again, chemistry with Rodolfo and uh, some of the tweets that came out. He's a competitive player also. I think he was uh, happy with our result in New England. We go and beat the, the best team in, in uh, winning Supporter Shield in record fashion, and we win at their place. So soccer is a funny game sometimes, but I do think the, the spirit after that game was that we came as a team. And we had that at different times during the year where the group really came together and performed well together. We'll go back to Lauren, and then we'll take a question from the call. Thanks, Rafa. Switching gears here to talk about the fan base. You're back in South Florida, a community you know very well from being a player. A player. How important are the fans and supporters to the long-term success of this club? Yeah, I mean, our fans are everything. Uh, we we The players come out and play, and the atmosphere at our stadium is like, um, it's, it's unlike any other in MLS. The energy, uh, the fans who are behind our goal, and, and the connection that we have with our fans, uh, that is why I want to make sure that we win here at home because they come out, they support us. Um, you know, they've been supporters uh, through wins and losses, 
and I want to make sure that our our players understand the importance of the connection with our fans going forward. We got Rafael Ramos on the call, then Ian. Hi, Chris. Good afternoon. So, um, my question is about the the list that you announced yesterday. Uh, several midfields uh, left, and I'd like to know uh, if the midfielder will be the focus of, for the next season. Uh, guys like uh, Victor Oloa and the, the Federica Higuain, also Chapman, has some uh, good names in the team. So, and what you can say about the, the um, some Brazilian players like uh, Giamotta from Santos and Rafael Vega from Palmeiras. Yeah, good question. I think uh, midfield is is an important uh, position for us that we'll look to bolster. I think um, you know some of the players on our list we we are still talking to, so we may bring some players back uh, and see if we can work through um, some of those discussions and and uh, returning players. But um, yeah, it, it is a focus of what we'll look at both internally and as you mentioned externally. Um, our scouts are out looking. Uh, Mark Brazon is traveling. I will travel um, to South America and look at some players. Um, it's great to be connected with good players, which we've always said. There's a lot of players around the world who are connected with our club. Um, all the names you mentioned are fantastic players that we'd love to we'd love to see play in Miami one day. But you know they're under contract with other teams, so I don't want to comment on the the individuals exactly. Next question, Ian. Thank you, Rafa. Hi, hi, Chris. Ian Hess with the Heron Outlet. Um, I, I wanted to kind of piggyback off of what Rafa had just said. With, you had mentioned getting younger, and there were a couple of guys, namely Josh Penn, Dylan Castanero, George Acosta, that, are, that were on sort of low-salary, younger-aged players that, that their contracts weren't picked up. I was curious as to the decisions there, and then also if, if there is an idea to bring maybe one of them back on different deals. But also there are a lot of high profile, uh, maybe like bigger name free agents in MLS uh, that were just announced last week by the PA. And just what you think uh, about bringing some of them in that, that, that those sort of high profile, uh, knowing that the sanctions are coming. Yeah, I mean, I'll start with the re-entry draft, the, the re-entry list, the, f the free agent list. Um, you know, those are conversations that uh, the coaching staff, the recruitment group is having constantly to go through um, possible options, uh, players that will help improve our team, players that fit with the current players that we have. And, uh, you know, putting the data with that, putting um, all the video scouting and uh, scouting that our coaches have done uh, facing these teams with these players. Uh, and then also, yeah, I mean, younger players are, are – um, players that you know this is a young league uh, we need energy you need to be able to move around the field and I think um, it's proven that you know teams like New England have have shown that sometimes their their counter-attacking ability their speed their athleticism um, has has gotten them some good results um, so it's something we'll look at uh, we want to make sure that as we're uh, you know not just getting younger but we're improving uh, we're getting smart soccer players, uh, players who are able to think on the field, solve problems for themselves. Um, discipline, we want to make sure that we're controlling our emotions on the field. I think we had, uh, we might have been top two or three in the league in, in yellow cards and, and probably red cards. So uh, that's one thing. We have to keep players on the field and, and not have suspensions. And so that's where the smart players who are thinking come in. We'll go to Dyron. Chris, personally, uh, right back and left backs are two positions that I've seen that you've changed a lot in, in names, uh, in the lineup, and so on. So I wanted to ask you if those are two positions that you are looking to fill up for the next season, and if, if y you are looking for it, uh, how? You are going for the young players, you are going for a loan. Uh, how do you think to fill those two positions in case you are thinking about it? Yeah, good question. Left back and right back, their positions we'll look at. Um, uh, you know, Kieran Gibbs is is coming back uh, at left back. Uh, we'll see uh, the depth in each of those positions, and the depth could come from players coming up from Fort Lauderdale. 
um, some of the some of the young players who have gone through our academy and who've had minutes with Fort Lauderdale this year will have opportunities. So I, I would love to have the combination of maybe a veteran player and a young player coming through for the future, uh, where you rely on a, a veteran player for maybe a half to three quarters of the season, but he's teaching the young player for the future, uh, working behind him. Of course, being a former player, you, you never want to lose your position. You want to play every match. Um, but those are the types of, of things with, with multiple competitions. You know, if you have the, the regular season and you have Open Cup and you have extra games, you're going to need everyone on the roster. Last question, Michelle. Uh, one of the things Phil talked about, and you mentioned it earlier, about um, grinding it next year, grinding out for ties as opposed to losing. And he pointed out, and people have pointed out, that you know Nashville only had one more win than you guys had, but they had like 17 ties. Your team had 18 losses, I think, something like that. So closing that gap between losses and ties seems to be a big key in making the MLF playoffs. Um, but that also means a different style of play. <clears throat> when the team came here, all the talk was about you know attacking, creative, lots of goal scoring and stuff like that. Uh, as you're putting together the new pieces of the puzzle for season three, um, does that come into play, into what kind of players you're looking for, if you're looking for players that are going to be playing for ties? And what does that mean about how the team will look next year? Is it going to be a different look of a team that's playing more for ties than doing the beautiful, creative soccer that you know everybody here was uh, promised at the beginning? Thank you. Right. Good questions, Michelle. I think, um, yeah, I mean, when you look at um, the results, Nashville comparing to, to us, I think it is, uh, it's a mentality of uh, we're going to fight for every point. And I think if you look at a lot of those one nothing games, there was moments in those games that we have to capitalize. Uh, and that's finishing chances when we have them. Um, being able to be a team that can create chances. And some of that comes down to holding more possession in the other team's half to help us get into scoring position to create these chances. And uh, having players who want the ball under pressure and being able to keep the ball a little better. So I think that may be some of the focus is getting players who can help us keep the ball a little bit more uh, and working on that every day. Uh, so you know that keeps you in games. If you have the ball, you defend less. Um, you know, we all want to attack and go for it and, and in games, uh, you know, put teams under pressure. But sometimes you have to get through with the result. And that's, that's the adjustments tactically that, that Phil and his staff have to make of sometimes you're playing on the road and, you know, you have a way to get a result and you play in a different way. Um, then, then you come home and you play in a different way at home because based on, one, the way your team plays and the way we're going to play at home, and the way the opponent plays and the way they come in. So I think uh, evaluating all of those situations and trying to decide how we want to be on that day, but there will be a set way of how we're going to play that we will um, try and sustain throughout the season. But the grit, that just comes down to mentality and the individuals on the team. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to all the media members. Uh, the press conference is going to be uploaded in the media assets folder. Thank you. Thank you.